I'm Ivan Boyevin, and um, I'm working at the SPF, Solar Technology Institute at the Ost University of Applied Science in Eastern Switzerland. And my topics, my key topics are long-term energy storage, um, especially on renewable metal fuels, power to X also, but uh, and then thermal storage. But I'm also working on fuel cell test bench and life cycle assessment since my um, master thesis was on that. Previously, I worked on solar thermochemical high temperature processes um, and the hydro thermal gasification of um, biomass. And today I'm happy to present our Horizon Europe project, Reveal, where we develop an energy storage cycle based on metal, uh, renewable metal fuels, which in our case is aluminium. And at first um, of my presentation, I will go into, I will explain our motivation and vision um, before I show the concept of the energy storage cycle and go into further details. So here we see an annual distribution of, of space heat demand in Europe. Here um, with the resolution per 40 times 40 square kilometers and per hour. Um, the absolute numbers here are from uh, 2011, so they're for sure changed. But uh, we know that approximately 50% of the energy demand for buildings is space and water heat. And still in 2022, 36% of this heat was produced from fossil fuels, which emitted a um, very significant amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. So we question um, how to cover this heat demand with renewable energy. And since I'm working in Switzerland uh, for for many years, I'm, uh, I'm German from the forest uh, originally, um, but uh, I brought here some Swiss scenarios. Um, here the annual load profile with an electrification, electrification scenario of um, replacing 70, 75% of oil boilers with heat pumps. And we see in the top graph um, that um, this electrification um, is uh, the demand is quite seasonally dependent. Um, the um, apps, the, the uh, total amount of energy increase or electricity increase is 10 terawatt hours. Um, in the second graph, we see um, the scenario of replacing 20% of the gasoline cars with battery electric vehicles. And the energy um, demand um, stays quite constant here with an ad additional uh, 3.7 terawatt hours of demand. So in total, um, it will require um, 13.7 terawatt hours of electricity additionally in this scenario and um, the next question is where uh, does this winter heat come from? With uh, keeping in mind that the electric grid always has to be in balance with generation and consumption. This might give us an answer. So this is a scenario from the Swiss energy perspective, 2050 plus. Here's split in the winter and winter half and summer half. And also here we see this, um, this electricity increase um, due to this electricity uh, electrification. Um, Switzerland also will replace their nuclear power with renewables, and there will be a slight increase in hydropower. And in 2015, um, it is expected that the 34 terawatt hours are produced from PV. Switzerland will depend on winter imports in this case of in 2050 
of nine terawatts hours. But in the summer, there is an export balance of nine terawatt hours. That um, comes to the next question. How can this summer energy be transported into the winter? So let's have a look at the technology map. So we're talking about um, high amounts, high amounts of energy and uh, long-term storage. So then we have the option of um, thermal energy storage, where um, we hear more um, of, of um, this pit solution from Jeffroy today. Um, and this application is especially uh, applied for district heating networks. The next option is uh, green synthetic fuels, for example, green methane and methanol. And the storage of this is state of the art. The industry, especially the chemical, chemical industry, um, does this for decades. Um, and the power to X power to X technologies are being developed and they have been progressed. Um, the application is uh, mostly interesting for the industry. And the third option is the renewable method fuels where solutions are developed for buildings and industrial applications. And um, here mainly um, the, this fuel is aluminum and iron. However, the technology readiness level is still uh, quite low. So the next question is, how do we heat our homes in winter? Um, and this is um, if we don't have a district heating network available. So let's assume the winter heat demand of our home is 11,000 terawatt hours. In the past, uh, we had to store about one cubic meters of heating oil in our homes to produce this energy. And we emitted nearly 2.1 tera uh, tons of CO2. Um, we can store um, in the summer solar thermal energy today in water tanks, or we can we also could store PV electricity um, in batteries, but this requires high storage volumes um, and also the investment costs are very high. But I mean, there is applications today going, especially with about uh, building water tanks and buildings. But our vision is that um, we produce this winter energy from aluminum. We need even less storage volume than, than heating oil today. And this can be done in CHP units. It doesn't only produce heat, but also can produce power. Um, but it will be an additional technology to, for example, a heat pump solution. Um, because I mean, it just makes sense direct if there is sun available to to produce it or use it directly um, in our homes. But when it's not available, then um, that it comes from this renewable metal fuel. So why aluminum? Well, first of all, it has a extreme high volumetric energy density. So it has minimal storage costs and space requirements. Um, here, I'd like to point out um, that in the case of um, hydrogen, um, the granometric energy density is without a storage tank. And um, if, if, the, the, um, if the weight of the storage tank is accounted for, then this number will come down as well. Now, aluminum uh, is, is, uh, has a high availability because um, it's the third most abundant element on the Earth's crust. 
It has low cost today. Check today the price again of aluminum. It's uh, one kilogram is about two euros. Um, there's safe handling, where it's non-toxic and uh, bulk material is not flammable. It's easy to store and transport. It's loss free storage. We know aluminum doesn't rust. Um, it, you know, it, there is a passivating, uh, passivative layer around the material that is formed immediately and uh, doesn't continue to grow. It doesn't require a pressure tank or uh, even a cryogenic tank. And uh, it has a flexible application. Um, it is not carbon based, so it doesn't need a CO2 uh, source, um, which for for green uh, methane, you need this uh, CO2 source. It's not temperature, um, the, the temperature level of the heat is not limited. Uh, we see that later, and it can be even um, applied in uh, small, small scales. Modular. So now we come to the concept. Um, in the summer, aluminum oxide is being reduced um, by renewable energy. And that produces only oxygen and aluminum. And aluminum is our energy carrier in this case. Um, we can store it, it's easily store, uh, to store and transport. Um, I also have to say I mean, this is an industrial process and it will be a central application. So the aluminium then is transported to your homes um, and when heat or electricity is required, um, you let it react with water, which produces hydrogen and heat. The hydrogen can be um, directly convert it to more heat and electricity. And this oxidation, aluminum water oxidation reaction does not only produce energy, but also um, our source material, the aluminum oxide. So we create like a closed loop here. So, the concept is based on aluminium as a seasonal energy carrier. It's carbon aluminium oxide reaction. We call this power to aluminium process. It has a bulk storage density of 23 megawatt hours per um, cubic meters. And um, the aluminium water oxidation reaction produces heat and hydrogen. We call this aluminium to energy process. We create a circular economy uh, concept here and the renewable energy recovery is more than 50 megawatt hour per square meters. So now I'd like to um, give a little bit of background um, from the storyline. Of, of this Alto energy process that has been developed at SDF. Um, we started with a project called EPOSTA that was a feasibility study. And um, we found that the concept was very interesting. So we continued uh, to develop here um, a, um, a batch setup in the hybrid stock. Um, the tests were very successful. So we continued this, but uh, in between, uh, we first studied and analyzed the um, option of using waste aluminum streams um, with the Allen Cycles project. And uh, now we further develop in the LOCHP project, um, the um, pilot plant, we build a new pilot plant for a continuous operation. And finally, last year, we started our Rising Europe Reveal project uh, in June, where we close the energy storage cycle by also developing power to new process with experts from the industry. So we teamed up uh, with nine partners from seven European countries, several experts from the aluminum industry, um, fuel cells engineers, life cycle analysts, 
and um, I'll show you who is uh, who is working on what. Here, of course, um, the um, our aluminium experts, Arctic Space Tech and Syntef, they are uh, developing a uh, CO2 free production of aluminium. Then we have a aluminium to energy process at high temperatures for um, the industry as a target application where directly aluminium oxide is being produced. And the second path where we work here at the SPF um, on is the low temperature path below 100 degrees Celsius where aluminum hydroxide is produced, which has to be um, first calcined to produce aluminum oxide to close to the material cycle. Now, this L2 energy process releases um, about 4.5 um, kilowatt hours of heat and uh, hydrogen, where when hydrogen, we, we directly convert the hydrogen fuel cell, um, where uh, here EH group uh, from Lausanne in Switzerland are working on this, where we reach at the end 6.5 kilowatt hours of heat and 2 kilowatt hours of electricity. And uh, our first target application is in the US. So at SPF, we are we're in this project, we're building a four kilowatt hour CHP unit for a continuous operation um, to be installed in buildings. So because um, we did not publish um, our new reveal findings yet, I have here some results from the Allen Cycles project of the hydrogen conversion. Um, where we um, had several samples uh, from post-consumer scrap and pre-consumer scrap being uh, looked into. And um, we see here the graph um, for the hydrogen conversion with the reaction, reaction conditions of uh, six, six molar um, sodium hydroxide solution. Uh, which we need as a promoter to uh, dissolve the oxide layer of the aluminium. So once that oxide layer is dissolved, the reaction uh, continues. And we see here some react slower and some faster, but all of them reach the, the maximum conversion. And then here we see the hydrogen yield based on the maximum theoretical value of like from the aluminium content. And um, we see that uh, because of uh, other metal impurities, um, even higher um, hydrogen yields can be reached um, because they also, these other metals react in this case. Then um, I like also um, just to give a little bit of insights of the um, power to aluminium process um, because uh, traditional aluminium production releases um, quite a bit of CO2. It's based on the whole Herald um, technology. And um, with this uh, technology, we are about two tons of CO2 per ton of aluminium is being emitted. But with the um, Arctos, Syntef, and Pacetech, um, and vertical inert anode cell is um, being uh, developed. And um, in this case, aluminium oxide is being reduced to aluminium only producing oxygen as, the, as I proposed in the concept, um, because inert um, anodes are being used here. So with the traditional hall herald process, um, carbon anodes are used uh, and they are consumed. So 
that's where this, uh, the CO2 comes from. But here, um, there is there is enough that oxygen cannot react with anything, so only oxygen is being released here. And the benefits um, to this process is um, also a, a quite an economical balance because um, the aluminum industry, um, they fall under the EU uh, emission trading system and um, also with emission Europe uh, emission targets in Europe, I mean, uh, the industry is under high pressure to, to reduce their CO2 emissions. And in this case, there is um, no taxes or, or uh, certificate costs are applied. Um, this technology um, you needs 20% less energy input, and um, it, it has the possibility to modular power feeding during peak hours and uh, power uh, shortage periods for optimal power price. There's only fit also 50% um, less space required for the same production capacity because cells can be smaller because the anodes are um, positioned differently and 40% less investment cost. Also 30% less operation cost because no carbon is consumed. And for this uh, for this process, um, demonstration plant in is planned uh, to be in operation in 2026. And with Ar Arctos, um, Trimet, uh, the aluminium industry from Germany, they uh, cooperate. So um, now I conclude. Um, a short summary, um, the advantage of aluminium as a renewable motor fuel um, is the extreme high volumetric energy density and cost um, effectiveness. Um, aluminium is highly abundant and available. The production for additional demand of aluminium is feasible. Um, Loss-free storage and easy and safe transport can be uh, applied here. Uh, the power to aluminium process require, of course, uh, we, it only makes sense to do this when there's no direct CO2 emissions and 100% renewable electricity. But uh, the technology for this CO2 free production of aluminium is on the way to market launch. Um, today, the TRL level is uh, between five and seven. Um, and with the aluminium to energy process here at AUST, um, we develop a um, CHP unit uh, with two kilowatt of heat and two kilowatt in the form of hydrogen. And uh, per dwelling, approximately 500 to 1,000 kilogram of aluminium as an energy storage material is used. Are required to uh, to cover winter peak demand of homes in Central Europe. Um, this is in the case of new buildings and no pass passive house. And um, last but not least, um, the aluminium concept is cost effective to supply a multi-family home with 100% solar heat and electricity. Um, the energy costs um, is expected to be below. Uh, 0 0.2 euros per kilowatt hours for end consumers. Um, and this is realistic uh, 2030. So uh, here is uh, also our social media where we um, publish new results. And, and um, I'd like to invite you to uh, connect with us. to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. So many thanks, uh, Ms. Berner, for the very, for yeah, very interesting insights. So interesting it's quite insights. a long process. Uh, long process. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure, uh, as you said, 2026, there will be this plan to have this <laughs> 
new uh, uh, solution with the inert anode. So I'm very sure in the time until there, I, I will ask you again to give a talk and tell about <laughs> how it is proceeding. <laughs> Um, so we have one question in the chat. I uh, will read it out and then you can answer. The question is from Mark uh, Hovitt. The question is, what is the round trip efficiency of this aluminum, alumina energy storage on the face of it? If it were efficient, um, aluminum refining would be much less energy intensive um, than it is. Um, what, what can you say about this? Uh, we can't hear you. Do you? Uh, the microphone is off. Okay. Um, so I just put up a slide uh, with uh, some energy efficiency for the power to aluminum to storage process. And um, oh, do you see the slide? No, now we see the end slide. Now we see the end slide. Oh, sorry. So the uh, it's still this slide. I'm not sure if you want to share a different one. You want to share this one. Yeah, maybe I just uh, answer the slide. So um, this uh, inert um, smelter process. Uh, can achieve efficiencies of 65%. And uh, considering a casting and shaping efficiency of 89% um, and a storage efficiency of 100%, we can reach, in this case, um, a charging efficiency of 63%, where the aluminum to energy um, efficiency we saw um, is um, basically 100%. But of course, um, uh, still have to, um, we still need to test the efficiency of the heat exchanger from the vessel, from the reaction vessel. Um, so if 95% of heat can be, uh, can be used here, then we reach uh, a total efficiency of more than Okay, many thanks. Um, I hope the, the um, question is answered. If not, maybe you can write in the chat as well and then, then you can exchange directly. So then we have time for the second question. It's from Paul Kajic, if I pronounce it right. The question is, right. what would a commercial product for houses look like? Like multiple modules for the ease of handling? Or would you say uh, this could be a service, central product production, and then distribution to units uh, to where heat is needed? Both. So, so aluminium is being produced uh, centrally and industrially. The aluminium is then transported to homeowners, just like wood pellets today, for example. And the homeowners, they would have, they would buy a CHP unit, um, install it. We'll see probably in their basement, just just uh, like we do it now, um, and then and then the industry will pick up the byproduct, the reaction product again to um, to get here the clothes to be cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So thank transport you. will be uh, still part of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I, it seems it's answered. Um, <laughs> Maybe we have time for um, one more question. Yeah, there's one more in the chat. So, um, would it be an alternative um, to the system on, uh, on sink? On sink. Yes, I uh, also checked if sink is an option. Um, however, um, availability um, for aluminium is much higher. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, at my prior work, uh, I worked on the uh, a temperature um, redox cycle to produce zinc from the sun. Um, so zinc for me is an interesting element, um, but um, 
the production, like we looked at the energy, the energy density, and um, aluminium is just uh, aluminium iron is just here uh, primer and metal, but for this solution, like for us, it's zinc is not the first you know, metal we would use for this application, but it is an option for sure. Okay, many thanks. Um, well, I think um, all the questions are answered so far. Uh, if someone else has a question as well, maybe yes. uh, he or she can write it in the chat and you can answer or leave an email or something or contact you directly. And then you can keep in, in touch and discuss if there's something left. Um, okay, so thank you again. And I... Uh, We'll uh, give the mic directly to Jeffrey uh, Gauthier with his, uh, as he said, very recent results from the weekly energy storage. Thank you. And I will start sharing my screen now. And now it should be fine. So thank you for... Uh, for this opportunity to present some uh, some result of this use case in uh, in the PTES in Hoytostrup. Uh, and thank you for the previous presentation. I thought it was uh, very interesting and very well presented. Uh, so my name is uh, Jeffrey Gauthier and uh, I'm a calculations engineer at uh, Plan Energy. It's a Danish uh, consultancy company specialized with district heating. And I'm also subtask leader of the work package D in uh, IAES uh, task 39, which is focused on large thermal energy storages. So to begin with, uh, what is a pit thermal energy storage, which is shortened as PTES, and where does it come from? And I will actually start by explaining where it comes from. So the history of PTES is coupled to solid district heating in Denmark. Um, and to be able to understand uh, solar district heating is large solar thermal plants that are connected directly to district heating. And it's a Danish specialty. So on this graph, you can see that uh, there are two leading countries with solar district heating. It's Denmark and China. Denmark has uh, a, a bit more than 1.6 million square meter of solar thermal uh, for district heating. And China has uh, a bit under 600,000 square meter. And this is the state, uh, this is the state in 2022. And typically, uh, solar district heating looks like this. It's a big uh, solar thermal field of uh, five to 20,000 square meter and a daily thermal storage. The history of solar district heating in Denmark is, uh, is a quite recent development, actually. Uh, in the past 10 to 15 years. And if we look more into the details uh, of the numbers, we can see that the fast growth has happened between 2010 up until 2016. And then there was the second range of growth uh, up until 2019. And since then, uh, the growth has been uh, really slow. And the reason for that is that in Denmark, there has been national politics aimed at favorizing solid district heating. Uh, and and this uh, these measures that um, were in place stopped in 2016 and then have been extended in a limited way up until 2019. So this explained the the sudden growth. It partly explains the sudden growth uh, in solid district heating in Denmark. So why what is the what is the relationship to pit thermal energy storages? Um, as I showed on the previous picture, there is most of the time. Um, uh, a short-term thermal energy storage coupled to solid district heating. And with those, it's easy in Denmark to cover about 5 to 20% of the heat demand with, uh, with the solar. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, the heat demand is lowest in the summer and highest in the winter. So with a daily storage, you can only cover this um, dark, darker yellow area. And it's a shame because the solar peak production happens in the summer. So all of this extra heat uh, is not used when you use a daily storage. So when using a seasonal storage to store the surplus heat, um, then you can reach higher solar fractions. You can store this extra heat in the summer and reuse it in the winter to cover a part uh, of the winter um, uh, heat demand. 
And that's what a seasonal storage does. And that's what the first PTES um, that were developed in Denmark um, was meant for. So what is a PTES? Well, a PTES, to be able to store such big amounts of, of heat, then you need a big amount of storing, storage medium. And in a PTES, the storage medium is water. So a PTES is a giant pit filled with hot water. The four main steps uh, to build a PTES are the following. First, you need to dig a hole in the ground and reuse the soil to build up the sites. Then you need to add a watertight liner to the sites such that the water that you will put in it uh, will remain. Uh, then you fill this pit that has the liner around it with water. And then to finish, you put an insulating floating cover on the top to make sure that the heat that is stored in the storage does not get out. Um, summed up in one image uh, is this diagram to the right. And um, you can see that uh, the, the soil that is being picked up is reused to build, um, to build the sites. The most technical and crucial elements of this technology are the diffusers that you can see here in the middle of the three first pictures um, that are the in and outlets of water. Then you have, of course, the liner that is making sure that the water stays in the, in the pit, and then the insulating cover. And just to give you an example of, uh, of a seasonal thermal energy storage, uh, it was actually a picture that was presented by my, uh, by my uh, predecessor. Uh, and it's located in the north, northern part of Denmark uh, in Drollinglun. And um, it's actually the fifth largest solar thermal plant in the world. It has 37,500 square meter of solar collectors. And the pit uh, itself is uh, 60,000 cubic meters of water. Now the storage capacity is between 5,000 to 5,500 megawatt hours. Um, so it's quite a big storage, it's gigawatt hour scale. And it has a charge and discharge capacity of 27 megawatt. The, the, how we can see that it's a seasonal storage is that it's being charged and discharged approximately two to 2.5 uh, times a year. So that's what we call a cycle. And the solar fraction uh, is 41%. So the heat demand covered by this system uh, with the solar field and the seasonal storage is 40%. And then the extra, uh, the additional heat, heat, um, heat sources are air or water heat pump, uh, bio, bio oil boilers, and then for the peak uh, demand, gas, uh, gas turbine and a gas boiler. Um, there are other examples in Denmark. There is Mastel, Gram, Voyens, and Tuflund. Uh, there is one example of PTES in Tibet, uh, Langkasi. And there is one being built in Germany right now. And all of them are coupled to uh, district heating, solar, uh, solar thermal, and are used for solar district heating. Now, how do we get uh, into a weekly use of such a technology? Um, and that is the latest development of the technology. It's the first of its kind. Um, it's being built, it has been built, sorry, it's now operational. It has been built in the Copenhagen area, as you can see on this map, uh, in 2022. And uh, the PTES is 70,000 cubic meters and it's not coupled to solid district heating. So it's the first of its kind because it's not coupled to solid district heating. Um, the charge capacity uh, or the storage capacity is 3.3 gigawatt hours. Uh, the reason for that is even though it's a bigger volume of water, it's because the delta T inside the PTES is smaller than in Bonin Uh The charge discharge capacity is 30 megawatt um, of power and is designed to do 25 to 30 cycles of charge and discharge per year. So compared with before, we have 10 times many more uh, uh, cycles. And this is why it's defined as a weekly uh, storage and not a seasonal storage. Now, the main heat source for this pit uh, is the district heating network of the Copenhagen area, and more specifically, the transmission network, which works at temperatures above 100 degrees. And then the heat that is stored in the pit is later used to 
distribute uh, in the district heating network of Hartsostrup, and this is a distribution network. So this district heating network has lower temperatures. And in this pit, uh, the top temperature for, for all year long is about 90 degrees. And this will be of, in, this will be of importance when talking about return on experience uh, with, the, with the construction. Now, to give you a bit more detail and zoom in a little on, uh, on what this PTES is used for. Um, first of all, it's, it's, it, as I said, it's used to optimize uh, the transmission uh, heat production. So in the Copenhagen area, it's combined heat and power and waste incineration plants um, in the summer period, which have uh, the same production, but the demand is rather low. So in order to ensure the flexibility, then it will be used for that. Uh, and the combined heat and power uh, plants, they produce when the prices of electricity are high. Um, and that's not necessarily when the heat demand is the highest. So again, this P, this P test is ensuring um, flexibility. Now, this, this way of using a P test is very unique. It's a unique business model because it's owned equally, the pit is owned equally by the transmission line operator and the distribution uh, line operator. VEX is the transmission operator and Hartsostrup is the local district heating network, which is located here. And um, the, the interest for, the, for Hartsostrup is to reduce the local peak load production, which is based on fossil fuels. And uh, the last point is that it's a demonstrator project. So it's the opportunity uh, to make a lot of measurements and validate technical designs, check that there is no leakage of water and see the impact on the environment. So the um, monitoring program that has been uh, implemented is led by Danish Technological University, DTU. It's funded by the Danish Energy Agency's program called EUDP. And again, the aim is to monitor the plant operation uh, to investigate the performance of the inlets and outlets. So it's the diffusers that I was mentioning earlier uh, and make sure that there's a good stratification uh, in the pit. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, it's also, uh, the monitoring program is also aimed at defining storage efficiency and determine the heat losses. Uh, and last but not least, it's, um, it's very, uh, it's, uh, People are, are very much looking forward to see the, the measurements results because they will be very precise and they will be enabling uh, validation of simulation models. And that's something that uh, all the people involved in this sector are looking forward to. Just a quick overview of the, um, of the measurement equipment that have been put. Um, the monitoring program will follow lots of, uh, of, uh, of values, uh, but mostly temperatures, uh, pH, and level of the water, and in general, the water quality inside the PITAS. Then temperatures and humidity uh, will be measured in the ground next to the PITAS to see the impact on the environment, uh, but also how, how fast the heat next to the storage is, is heated. Well, the, ground next to the storage is being heated up. The temperatures and humidity will be measured in the lid. Uh, this is more for operational issues and to see how the materials react with time uh, uh, and with operations. And there will also be heat flux sensors in the lid. And then there, also, there will also be local weather conditions uh, measured. And as I said in the beginning, there is a leakage system to make sure that the liner is uh, always watertight. Now, the first uh, results, uh, monitoring results uh, from 2023 are promising. So as I, as I said, the, the pit was done in 2022 and it was heated up in 2022. And then it was tested in late 2022, beginning of 2023. Uh, and now, since February, the real operations of charge and discharge between the transmission network and the distribution network uh, have started. And what we can see so far is that um, the temperature uh, that is on both ends of the pit. So I don't know if you've noticed on the pictures that I've shown so far, but it's, it's a quite long pit. 
uh, and the diffusers in this case are located on this end. So you see the, the horizontal bars here represent where the diffusers are located. So there has been a lot of questioning about if when you put heat, uh, hot water at, at, at the inlet here, uh, if it will be distributed along the whole way. And what you can see when you try to see the temperature difference between this line of measurement and this line of measurements at the same height, uh, you can see that at the top, it's uh, it's close to zero and it doesn't go over two, uh, two Kelvin. And then for the other, uh, other heights uh, at 5.5 meters here and 2.5 meters, it's very close to zero. So this means that when you put the heat in on one end, then the design has been done properly. And this means that the, the stratification is done all along uh, the pizza. So that's a very good sign. Uh, because it's the first p-test uh, that has been implemented that has this kind of long shape. Um, and it's, it's good to know if the design of the diffusers is, is, um, has been done properly or not. The other set of results uh, that are, have been available is, um, and these are preliminary results. Uh, we, it takes a long time to validate that everything has been calculated properly that uh, aberrant measurement points are uh, deleted and so on. But with the preliminary results that we have, uh, then we, we can say that since February this year uh, and up until May, uh, sorry, up until the end of May, so up until the beginning of June, there have been three charge, full charge and discharge cycles that have been done. Um, and the, this is lower than the activity that we've expected. And this is mostly due to some technical issues, uh, some of the equipment of the transmission network, but also of the distribution network uh, needs to be replaced and maintained. Um, so this will be handled and this is being handled as we speak. Um, and the, the, there is also a requirement for coordination between the transmission operator and the distribution operator which need to give in advance their needs. Uh, and it also needs to take into account the whole production of the, of the, of the heat in the Copenhagen area. So that's a big area to cover. Um, but all again, those are being handled and um, I, we're expecting that by 2024 um, and, and already by the end of 2023, the full operation of the pit uh, is to be expected. Now, the challenges of the first weeks of operations are not the only ones that uh, have been faced uh, with this project, I, I think you can imagine. Uh, and there have been a lot of challenges also during implementation. And as main technical consultants on the project uh, at Plan Energy, this is it is our job to make sure that the project gets implemented properly and that all issues that occur along the way are handled. Um, so, most challenges that have been faced in the implementation are related to the high temperature resistant liner. As I said, this pit is a bit special because it will have a top temperature of 90 degrees all year long. Is in a seasonal storage, uh, it's rather 90 degrees in the summer and then it can go much lower in the winter. Um, so 90 degrees is the max temperature and it's only in the summer months. Uh, in this case, the top temperature is around eight, 90 degrees all year long. Um, and, and for that, there has been um, a special, special kind of material that was developed. Uh, it's a high temperature resistant polypropylene HTRPP. Uh, and while this material is made to be having a very good behavior at high temperature, it's even designed to be able to sustain over 30 years of operations at 95 degrees. But this also means that it's not really appropriate for cold weather. Um, so during uh, the implementation, the cold weather in Denmark uh, has made it challenging. Uh, some cracks have appeared, uh, some leakages were, um, were um, observed. Uh, so the manufacturer had to make a new version of the material that is that has better properties at lower uh, lower temperatures, and and this new version has been working fine. Uh, 
Uh, but this is not the only improvement that was related to this, the, these implementation issues. Um, the implementation procedure itself has also been improved uh, as a result of those, um, as of those uh, uh, cracks that happened during, uh, during the initial, um, initial implementation. And one of, the, one of the solutions that were developed on the way it's, as I said, this material, liner material that is put around the edges of the pit, uh, as I'm showing you around here now, uh, it's, not, it's not behaving so well at low temperatures. So on the lowest uh, temperature days, um, then there has been an irrigation system that is sending in hot water to the sides of the pit uh, and that are heating up uh, the liner along the way such that it, it stays at a, an acceptable temperature during the filling because the filling happens in the winter period. And as you can see here, in, as in a thermal, uh, thermal picture, uh, this irrigation system is working quite well. The, the sides that are not under the water are being heated up by, by this irrigation system. And uh, since then, there has been almost no issues except one, uh, because those uh, uh, liner issues during implementation were not the only one. There has been issues when some snow was showing up, of course. Uh, some animals have been getting trapped in the pit. Um, but um, while removing this irrigation system, uh, there, is, there is one last damage that was done to the liner uh, and it was fixed. And, then, and since then, there has been no uh, leakages uh, reported at the pit. So that's, that's good news. And we're all of those experiences uh, are shared in the report. Uh, that's that's the deal we have with the EUDP, the Danish Energy Agency, um, is that we publish a report on those and those experiences can benefit uh, uh, such uh, applications further. So to finish my presentation, I would like to say that um, there is an, an international energy agency Energy storage, uh, TCP, technology collaboration program. That's a lot of anagrams. Uh, program that is working on PTES as one of the main four large thermal energy storage technologies. Uh, it's This is task 39. And within this project, we have identified the four main steps in the lifetime of a large thermal energy storage project. Uh, the first step is the uh, opportunity phase, uh, the pre-design. Then you have the actual design where you go more in depth with the techno-economic study. Uh, then there, there's the tender phase where you make the specifications for the large thermal energy storage. And then there's the implementation and operation phase. And all those phases uh, uh, have been identified and uh, some information material for four different technologies will be distributed as a result of task 39. My point with this slide is to say that PTES and large thermal energy storages in general are deeply connected to district heating and industrial application. And the reason is that, as I've mentioned several times, these are very large uh, thermal storages. So when you're speaking of gigawatt hour scale of energy storage, then you need to be associated with a large heat demand. Um, and the good thing about LTES, large thermal energy storages, is that the bigger they are, the better they are because they are cheaper uh, and they're just as reliable. And there are projects currently in the pipeline in Denmark and, in a, and abroad for PTES of over 5,000, uh, uh, 500,000 cubic meters of water. Uh, and this is both with solid district heating uh, or coupled to solid district heating or not. So just coupled to district heating. And so I, I have no doubt that there will be more PTES uh, to hear about in the future. If you're interested uh, in Task 39's uh, results, then please uh, contact, contact the task manager, which is Vim, uh, or me, or your national uh, IES TCP uh, delegate. And there is also Task 41 uh, that is currently active as well, working on the economics part of, uh, of thermal energy storage. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Oh, thank you very much. Very, uh, yeah, very interesting to see these results because it's, uh, 
Yeah, the most um, it's always very interesting to see what comes up if you have a, a demonstration project. It's an important part and to see which parts can be improved as well. You will never know if you never test it. <laughs> so very nice to see. I was surprised about the part with the animals, uh, though. <laughs> I hope you have someone checking around if there's an animal trapped or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, one question in the chat is from Rini Schwermer. It is, uh, what is the advantage of using uh, solar thermal collectors over photovoltaic in combination with heating elements? Um, I, I would say it's uh, quite easy. With a, with, a, with a solar thermal field, you can produce... Uh, two to three times as much energy uh, and the energy produced is directly heat. So it's a very low tech solution. You use the heat, uh, the, the heat from the sun directly. And with that, you receive, uh, yeah, with that, you produce heat uh, for your district heating network. So that's the easiest way to, to produce uh, heat with the sun. Yes. So I guess it's answered with this. Another question from Natalia. She says, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Would it be possible to have it on a smaller scale for urban environments? So seasonal storage um, for urban environments is, is a complex issue because as you've seen, you, you require a bit of space. Um, the alternative is to have a tank thermal energy storage, which is just a, a metal tank um, so it, this is more space efficient, I would say, um, but it's it's less appropriate to seasonal storage because the volume that you can get in it is rather limited. Uh, but there are concepts uh, that are being studied. Uh, it, there's a project called Gigates that is an Austrian uh, um, Austrian research funded uh, uh, project that Plan Energy was also uh, also helping with. Uh, that has studied different concepts of putting these seasonal pit thermal energy storages in the city. Uh, and those concepts uh, involve making a bit more evolved concepts where you can reuse the surface for a parking lot or for a road or uh, uh, similar, similar concepts. So there are uh, ideas there, but this, this very low tech and cheap uh, approach is more appropriate for uh, just out on the outskirts of the cities rather than inside the cities. Uh, so for for seasonal storage with uh, with urban areas, I would uh, I would I, I would look very much forward to see uh, how this um, this renewable metal fuel uh, solution is developing because I think it's it's quite promising. Okay, thank you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ms. Boerle <laughs> thinks the same. So we, I guess we'll just make a, the same session in a couple of months. <laughs> yeah. Also, thank you for your talk, uh, Jeffrey. Um, yeah, I think um, like in Switzerland, we have uh, quite tough regulations and space uh, limitation, um, and the, the price of the of the ground is very very high. But uh, lately there is some developments and um, it looks promising that some pit storage will be built in the near future. So, we, yeah, and there might good be to hear. It's good to hear. Yeah. And, and there are other alternatives. <laughs> no, uh, <try> it. <laughs> to, there are other alternatives to reuse uh, existing infrastructure, old mines uh, uh, and, and borehole thermal energy storages which are boreholes uh, bored in the ground. Um, and those are using still uh, some space, but they're less uh, intensive in terms of usage of the surface afterwards. So, so there are alternatives uh, to pit for, for, for long duration. Uh, and, and it's just so far the, the cheapest way to, to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. And I, I know that um, Switzerland is looking heavily into borehole thermal energy storages, for example. And there is the, the last technology is studied in, in task 39 is aquifer thermal energy storages. So that's also another source, but that requires, of course, an, an aquifer. Yes, aquifer and of course, boreholes. 
Uh, but really lately, um, you know, we're looking at uh, pit storages uh, in specific, uh, where like we have we have uh, surface mines already that can be utilized. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have another question um, from um, Fuchs, um, which is, uh, is it a problem to get rid of the rainwater from the top cover of the thermal storage unit? Very good question. Uh, Very good. And yes, uh, it, is, uh, it is an issue. Yes, Yvonne, if you could mute. Yvonne, if you could mute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, so, so it it is an issue uh, during implementation. Uh, the rain needs well can damage the the construction of the of the pit, um, and and after implementation, then it gathers at the top. But the lid uh, the lid solutions that have been developed recently uh, are made to handle the rainwater. So this is this is an issue that is now handled with the the current solutions that have been developed. Um, so. So it is an issue and there is a solution for it now. Uh, the PTES is becoming more and more of a mature technology with a different return on experience. And I'm pretty sure that, that all the issues that, uh, that it can face uh, uh, have uh, found a solution and, and will be handled uh, in the future. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um... So I'm not sure if there's any more question or I'm, I'm curious about something as well. I was wondering if you can give an estimation about the cost per kilowatt hour. Um, I... Yes. I mean, it's, it's, always a, it's always a tough issue. What I can give you is the total uh, uh, levelized cost of heat in Droning Lund, mm -hmm. including the pits. Mm -hmm. Because evaluating the cost of the pit per megawatt hour is, is a it's a complicated uh, exercise, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but in, in drawing load with the initial design, uh, the cost of levelized cost of heat were about 60, 65 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, okay. and that's with with this coverage of uh, of um, a forty one percent solar fraction, and this is without any sorts of subsidies. So, so this is the reasonable price, but that includes the solar collector field as well. So if you remove the solar collector field uh, with this specific application, the, the storage is about 20, 30 euros per megawatt hour. But mm -hmm. it, it depends on a very, very high amount of factors. Uh, but what it means is that it still can be competitive uh, with, with fossil fuels. Uh, especially if you have subsidies or taxation of, of fossil fuels. And what is important to know uh, when it's used with solar district heating, uh, but also when it's used with a waste heat source that is uh, available uh, regularly, is that it's stable prices over time. And that's not something you get with fossil fuels. So once you have your solar, uh, solar district heating application, then the solar heat price is stable over time. Whereas, uh, uh, yeah, because the fuel is is free, uh, and that's that's what makes a difference. Yes, I see. Yeah, sounds promising to me. <laughs> so, okay, I think we we already ten minutes over time. Please excuse for this. Um, many thanks again for for your presentations. I really, uh, maybe I just contact you in a couple of months again to make a second version to get, <laughs> to see how everything is um, uh, developing. <laughs> and yeah, many thanks to the listeners. Um, normally at this point, I give an, uh, a little spoiler for the next on seminar, but in August, there will be a summer break. Hence, there's no spoiler this time. <laughs> <laughs> 